All right, so I'll be speaking on the multimodality management of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, no uh, closures. The objective is very briefly clinical presentation of uh, trigeminal neuralgia and talk about some of the various treatment modalities from a non medical perspective, and then uh, uh, go over some of the clinical outcomes and complications associated with these interventions for trigeminal neuralgias. Very briefly, as many of you know, uh, the classic presentation of trigeminal neuralgia is stereotype paroxysms of pain in one or more um, distributions. They can be intense stabbing or electrical and shock-like. They have stereotype triggers including light touch, brushing your teeth, chewing, smiling, wind, speaking. Some people say sweet tasting foods. Um, the etiology, there's this idea of the ignition theory of uh, trigeminal neuralgia that the, with demyelination or some kind of focal injury to the trigeminal nerve itself um, that incites this cycle uh, leads to hyperexcitability of the in, injured afferent, so the, the pain receiving fibers, and this can be from a tumor, multiple sclerosis, uh, vascular compression, et cetera. That being said, even though we have this idea that there's this blood vessel classically that repetitively damages the trigeminal nerve and causes um, this hyperexcitability of the nerve, patients with trigeminal neuralgia don't always have neurovascular conflict. So um, in the study by Lee et al., uh, they took a series of 219 patients um, with TN that were going to get microvascular decompression and demonstrated that um, 28.8% of these, so nearly 30% of these patients didn't have this classic um, neurovascular conflict when they looked at them um, within the OR. On the other flip side, people with neurovascular conflict don't always have trigeminal neuralgia. If you take people in the audience, for example, 17% of us will have a blood vessel touching the trigeminal, trigeminal nerve, but none of us will have that pain. So if you extrapolate this into the normal population, that means that 99.9% .9 of people with a blood vessel near the trigeminal nerve don't have trigeminal neuralgia, so it's largely asymptomatic. So it doesn't completely explain the picture. As far as the classification of trigeminal neuralgia goes, Birchall um, had this great series where he described that there are different types of trigeminal pain. So our classic TN1 or um, type 1 trigeminal neuralgia has the episodic parasitismal sharp shooting pain and less than 50% of the pain is this chronic underlying component that never goes away. Conversely, type 2 TN is predominantly chronic with a more than 50% chronic component that's burning, gnawing, aching and they don't have um, pain relief. Um, between these intervals and it's constant throughout the day. And type 1 is generally what people talk about when they say that you have a success for a neurosurgical procedure. Those are all talking about the sharp shooting lancinating pain and not the chronic underlying pain. And then also Tegretol, Trileptol, medical management, it's really better for the type 1 pain and not as good for the type 2 pain. These are some of the kind of more um, rarer types or not so typically treated with uh, neurosurgical interventions, neuropathic pain if there's an inadvertent injury from like a dental procedure, deaffrontation pain if we intentionally injure the nerve like say during a balloon compression or radio surgery and we cause pain as a result of that, anesthesia dolorosa being the most common example. Symptomatic TN where there's either a demyelinating plaque or post herpetic neuralgia that causes facial pain. And then atypical facial pain, this used to be kind of a wastebasket term, but really it should be reserved for where there's a predominantly psychogenic um, component of the pain. Medical management, as we all know, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, gabapentin, phenytoin, Lyrica, patients initially respond 75% of the time, but eventually half of these patients fail medical management, which is where neurosurgery comes in. Radiosurgery is focused radiation, typically anywhere from 80 to 90 gray to the nerve itself. One dose, they go home, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Minimally invasive, um, procedures such as balloon compression, glycerol rhizotomy, and radiofrequency rhizotomy are percutaneous options where we enter the foramen ovale in order to damage the nerve itself, allowing pain relief in that fashion. And then neurosurgery, as we know, microvascular decompression. We're trying to find the etiologic cause of the, um, the trigeminal neuralgia, typically a blood vessel or a vein, 
um, pushing on that nerve, causing the pain. So this is a very busy slide, but basically it goes over all the risks and benefits um, of each of these procedures from the least invasive, which is stereotactic radiosurgery, a little bit more invasive percutaneous um, procedures, and then the most invasive microvascular decompression. But if you really want to summarize it, the percutaneous and radiosurgical ones are safe, are fast outpatient. The drawbacks are that we are actually damaging the nerve and not treating the underlying cause, which potentially could be uh, neurovascular conflict, and that there is this small, less than 1%, but real chance of causing anesthesia dolorosa, or as it entails, painful numbness, because we damage the nerve so much that they have constant pain that is worse than the trigeminal pain that they um, report. And this is very, very, very challenging to treat, so we really try not to go there. Microvascular decompression on the other side, the benefits, it's non-destructive, it treats the cause potentially, and it may be curative. Um, on the flip side, however, it is an open neurosurgery, it requires general anesthesia, potential lethal complications such as stroke, death, paralysis, all those things. MVDs were initially performed by Dandy back in the 1930s, but popularized by um, Janetta in 1967. And this idea of the neurovascular conflict, we find in this case, the superior cerebellar artery, which is the most often um, the culprit to trigeminal neuralgia. Um, as we grow older, the cerebellum and the rest of our brain, we start, it starts to atrophy. The blood vessels that are normally pushed away by the volume of the brain, they start to sag and they can start hitting the nerve. Um, during an MVD, this neurovascular conflict is identified um, and lifted off the blood vessel and a cotton pledge it placed in its stead. Um, when no offending vessel can be found, uh, we perform a massage or an internal rhizotomy, which damages and stuns the nerve to a point where they have um, pain relief. As we mentioned before, patient selection is important. These are typically younger patients with little or no medical comorbidities. Radiographic evidence, when I counsel my patients, if there's something that's very definitive and it looks like it's a cause, I say that this supports the diagnosis, but really it is the clinical presentation that drives my decision making. But if this is there, it really kind of is the cherry on top and say, I think that you would do well from this procedure. Classical trigeminal neuralgia, like I mentioned before, and this is not something until that I learned um, into my training with Dr. Paradian and um, through my own um, experience, but if you look back in the literature, the fine caveat to all these studies is that the 90% pain-free rate is really just the TN1 pain. They don't really report on the chronic uh, gnawing pain. So patients, if you don't manage their expectations and say, really, this is what we're trying to treat here, if you get some of the relief from the type 2 pain, that's an added benefit, and oftentimes it does happen, but not all the time. Then also the patient preference not to have numbness um, through a destructive procedure. The procedure itself, I, I prefer to have the patients in a lateral park bench position um, to help with uh, getting the shoulder out of the way and then allow access to the retrosigmoid area. Two thirds of the incision is above um, the mastoid notch, one third below. We do a curvilinear incision. I like to do mine along the, the length of the transverse sigmoid junction. This allows the dura to stay moist during the procedure itself, so you don't have this shriveled dura that's very challenging to close at the end. Um, but if you do do the incision so it's flapped this way, a lot of irrigation to the, the dura will allow it to get back to its normal consistency and allow closure. And like we mentioned before, finding the neurovascular conflict, lifting it off with microsurgical techniques, placing a Teflon uh, sponge, and then this allows um, the separation and prevention of further continuous injury. Can we try this video? Oh, yay. So this is a um, half by half cotenoid. So this craniectomy is about a centimeter and a half in size. Um, the cut on the, the transverse sigmoid junction right here, the cerebellum is posterior this way. This is a superior petrosal vein acoustic tubercle, trigeminal nerve right here. And you can see that there are a duplicated loop of SCA right here coming down. And this one is a little not as 
um, compressive, but you can see another loop of the SCA right here, and it's really pinching in. You can see the indentation of the trigeminal nerve at the root entry zone right here. Now, one thing of note, the root entry zone can be up to 11 millimeters away from the actual insertion into the trigeminal nerve, so anything that's close enough or close by, you have to kind of look, and at this point, we're reflecting the nerve back and forth, which kind of serves as a massage and rhizotomy, and can also benefit the patient even if this um, neurovascular conflict wasn't the cause of the pain. This is the Teflon sponge. This is very fluffy and that we use to tent the nerve away from the root entry zone and in doing so um, prevent the continued mechanical damage that's happening to the nerve. This is a fiber and sealant that we use in order to glue the, the Teflon sponge in place and prevent um, this from floating away after we, we irrigate and have the CSF uh, fill up the richer sigmoid cavity again. Outcomes like we spoke of before, 99 to 95 percent of patients have complete initial relief of their T1, TN1 pain without medications. Long-term relief, for whatever reason, 4 percent a year. So patients initially may have complete relief of the pain, but even if the Teflon sponge stays there, these patients do have recurrence of the pain, which makes us wonder, is there some kind of permanent damage to this nerve? Is there some more molecular biologic reason um, that causes this nerve to be hypersensitive so that they have a recurrence of pain um, after the initial um, uh, conflict is resolved? Compl um, complications like we spoke of, stroke, seizures, cranial nerve dysfunction. The biggest complication um, would be hearing loss actually related to this. Anytime you have um, uh, CSF egress, particularly in older patients, you do run the risk of uh, cranial nerve rate sagging down and um, patients can have ipsilateral hearing loss. Dizziness and disequilibrium from irritation um, of eight, and then CSF leak less than 1%. Moving along, percutaneous options include minimally invasive techniques. Um, we gain access through uh, puncture through the lateral aspect of the oral commissure, aiming at the mid pupillary line and just two centimeters anterior to the tragus. This is pretty quick, about an hour, maybe two hours for um, the more awake asleep awake procedures. And this is better served for poor surgical candidates who aren't. Um, eligible for being off anticoagulation for a long period of times, have a lot of car cardiac mor morbidities that prevent them from being under anesthesia for a long period of time. And also patients, for example, that would benefit from very focal ablations if they only have trigeminal neuralgia in a single distribution. It does require that they are very cooperative if you are performing a glycerol injection or radiofrequency ablation. This is, again, the landmarks that we spoke of that we kind of aim towards, and this is a schematic that demonstrates how we actually get there. This is a skull model, and it demonstrates that by going in through this kind of oblique angle up to the skull base, we can enter the foramen ovale, and in doing so, get into following the third division of the trigeminal nerve, enter the gusarian ganglion just lateral to the cavern sinus and the, the carotid. This is a summary slide that kind of talks about the different mechanisms. Glycerol rhizotomy, we don't use typically anymore. It requires the patients to do kind of a limbo-like procedure. They have to tilt their heads in certain directions throughout the procedure. They have to be somewhat awake in order to be able to tilt their heads, or you can have them asleep and tilt it for them. But essentially, it was initially discovered because they used to mix trivalent alcohol um, to stain the gusterian, gusterian uh, ganglion for radiosurgical procedures, and they noticed that these patients were getting relief um, prior to even the SRS. RF rhizotomy, they, we use electrical stimulation to identify the individual rootlets of the trigeminal nerve. We wake the patient up, stimulate um, 0.1 to 0.4 volts and up to a, a single volt, and say, is this where you have the pain? And they would experience tingling in that area, and then that confirms the location. We get them back sleepier and then perform thermal lesioning um, in those areas, um, which allows for ablation of the, the sensory fibers there. And then balloon compression is actually a mechanical disruption of the nerve itself. We insert the 2E needle into foramen ovale, take lateral fluoroscopy, ensure that we're there. And this is actually an older version of my slide. This is um, incorrect. This is actually, it actually damages the axonal um, rootlets, so, or the axonal fibers. So it's actually 
damaging the triggering mechanisms of the pain. So um, as we talked about the ignition theory of trigeminal neuralgia, by numbing them to a point where the triggers no longer elicit the pain, that's how they receive the pain relief. Like we said, glycerol rhizotomy requires patient cooperation, as does RF rhizotomy, so you really need someone that's going to be able to be woken up and cooperate, um, specific divisions of the nerve. And balloon compression, it is beneficial in the sense that you can do it while the patient's asleep, so they don't have to be cooperative. It's nonspecific, it treats all three divisions of the nerve, um, V2 and V3 best, and it has preservation of the corneal reflex, which is important. As far as the anatomy goes, this is a schematic of the gristle rosotomy. You see the, the um, omnipake or visipake that we use to stain the ganglion so we know we're in the right spot. Um, this is um, the typical um, radiographic response that you want to see to show that you are injecting in the correct area. As far as balloon compression goes, sorry, this is a, a lateral shot and this is the forum and ovale right here. This is the needle inserting into the foramen of Ali. We have our finger inside the mouth when we're inserting. Um, one, to make sure that we don't puncture into the cheek. Two, to, that we can actually feel a masseter reflex as the 2E needle inserts into the foramen of Ali. We then switch to a lateral view, which demonstrates that we're past the clival line, and the 2E needle is just at the entry. If we go in too deep, we can injure the cavernous sinus or the carotid artery, which we don't want to do. Um, more of a technical nuance, if we enter more anterior medially, that allows us to aim away from the cavernous sinus. Um, so that's uh, um, a nuance that's important if you start along the skull base and kind of shimmy your way into the foramen of valley. What we look for is this very stereotyped kind of pear-shaped ballooning, um, and it's very important actually to see it under the cella. If you the balloon kinds to be, uh, if the balloon is a little bit more circular and it seems to be detached from the cella um, or outside the clival line, you know you're a little short. Um, patients can have some benefit because you are along the third uh, trigeminal. Uh, rootlet, but it won't give them complete pain response. And then the RF rhizotomy, finally, once you're inserting, based on your location from the clival line, either five millimeters before it, five millimeters at it, or after it, or five millimeters, or exactly on it, rather, you can target the individual um, rootlets of the trigeminal nerve. And this is very helpful um, because, as you can see, this needle is going right at the clival line. This particular patient needed to be stimulated and ablated in V1. So then we went past and a little past the clival line and then woke the patient up, stimulated, um, ensured that we were at V1, and then put the patient back very sleepy and ablated and then tested or sensation afterwards. Once they have some degree of numbness, then we know that we've adequately uh, ablated the nerve. Stereotactic radiosurgery is the least invasive, I would say, but it also has the highest rate of um, recurrence, but this is particularly for patients that have multiple medical comorbidities, older patients in their 80s and 90s, and other patients that have failed other treatments, and you're kind of like, okay, maybe we should try this um, as a last-ditch effort. Um, our UCLA methodology, we use a linear accelerator, um, which uses photons, and we deliver 90 gray, which um, we've shown has the best benefit and least amount of side effects. We use a thermoplastic mask, which is um, when we basically take this plastic mesh that's heated using a fine cut CT scan. We can mold it to their face so that it keeps their face completely still during the radiosurgery uh, delivery, and we can ensure accuracy less than a millimeter. This is how we used to do things, the Lexol frame on the right, and there are some institutions that still do this, even big academic institutions, um, but we've moved far away from there, and the literature supports that we achieve the same degree of accuracy. This is just kind of a fancy picture because I like fancy pictures. And you can see that this is the trigeminal nerve being um, targeted with a four millimeter isocenter um, along the right nerve at 90 gray. As I mentioned before, even though it's minimally invasive, delayed um, relief, it can take up to anywhere from two to six weeks to six months to get full pain relief. During that time, you're wondering, is this working? And the patient continues to experience pain. There's a 60 to 90 percent rate of pain freedom at two to seven years, but really there's a high rate of recurrence, 50 uh, percent recurrence at five to ten years. Um, but 
The complications are very low, uh, anesthesia do dolorosa less than 1%, facial numbness 15 to 30%, and none of the other things such as um, you know, stroke, death, et cetera. So this is a really good treatment option for patients that are averse to complications. And then finally, and these are my final set of slides, T and treatment outcomes. So if you look back on the literature, um, the meta-analyses demonstrate that the, that the numbers I have shown you as far as um, the small individual studies are pretty accurate. If you look at microvascular decompression, you really do achieve about a 92% um, immediate pain relief. Um, at follow-up, it drops off to about 75%. Um, radiofrequency ablation, similar, 90%, but they're a little bit higher rate of recurrence, 50% um, at last follow-up, which in this study was at least five to 10 years. Percutaneous balloon compression, initial pain relief is great, 98.5%, but then um, a little bit of fall off as well, but not as much as the radiofrequency ablation, so they have durability of response, 80% um, at five to 10 years. And then radio um, surgery, uh, again, good pain relief, 80%, um, not as good as the other ones, but then a high rate of recurrence at 58%. If you look at the complications, MVD, no one dies from radio surgery, at least for TN. But then if you look at the mortality, MVD, 0.3%, very low, but not insignificant. Hearing loss, 1 to 19% in these mental analyses. Facial numbness, so again, highest with the percutaneous balloon compression, and uh, the more numbness you have, actually, the, um, there's a correlation with treatment response. Radio frequency, similarly, high rates of numbness as well, SRS, not so much. Um, and then corner, corneal anesthesia, low rates in the percutaneous balloon compression, a little bit higher in RF if you're treating V1. Trigeminal motor weakness, you have to counsel patients that they will have some masseter weakness. You can have some drooling associated with that, but 99% or very high 90s percent of these patients improve in weeks to months. And then this is just a really quick schematic or graph showing MVD, really good durability, balloon compression afterwards, RF after that. This is my last slide, summary slide. So there are a very wide range of available options. Not all trigeminal neuralgia patients are the same, so you really have to focus on patient selection and um, patient preference as what they want. At UCLA, we really try to focus on um, if they're eligible, go with MVD because they can have really good lasting pain relief. After that, we do balloon compression if they have multiple um, trigeminal uh, nerve roots involved. RF if it's one single rootlet and they're a very cooperative patient. SRS if they really are averse to any kind of invasive operation or anesthesia. We've really moved away from glycerol rhizotomy because it, it's just not great um, in my opinion. Um, and so just really know your patient, know what they want, and then give them the best treatment outcome. Those are my references. Thank you.